Uh, we're both happy to be here. John's been doing this for close to 15 years. I've been doing it for almost seven. Uh, we've got quite a, a variety of questions that we're going to go through. Uh, so I think we'll just hop right in. Um, as Karen mentioned, uh, we've got uh, our questions that were submitted in advance. So here are the, uh, the seven that we've got from uh, some of the attendees. And as she said, there is the question panel off to your right if you have a question. As we're talking through these questions, feel free to jump in and uh, we'll address it either at that time or at the end of the uh, session. So are we ready to dive into our first question, uh, John? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the best starting point uh, for those of you who are joining out of as much curiosity as wanting specific, um, you know, factual uh, details is to just talk about sort of what document automation is. And at its most basic level, there are sort of two uh, two sort of interpretations of uh, document automation. The first would be uh, simply taking data that's in your case management system and dropping it into a document from sort of like a Mad Libs perspective where you just fill in the blanks with whatever's in your case management system or whatever data source you're using. The other option is to actually ask questions in a separate sort of interview structure, either in the document or in a separate program, and then have the program be able to make logical decisions on what should be included in the final document and what should be excluded. So if you're creating, say, a, an operating agreement, maybe you have uh, one member, maybe you have multiple members in that document, and based on how you answer questions, that document changes, and your final product in either case is generally speaking a word or other word processor document that you can edit as you normally would edit a word processor document. So you're not stuck with the final output being a static PDF if you're working in a word processor. Yeah, but you can also automate PDFs as well, Jeff. Um, well, so yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, document automation isn't just for word documents or word perfect documents. You can also automate PDF documents, and I think that's something that, that a lot of people uh, forget sometimes. So, you know, if you have an estate plan and you're doing an SS4 along with that, you can you can usually um, automate that as well. And I think um, one other thing I want to touch on is I, I always draw the line between merge automation and complex automation. And so merge automation would be something uh, like a basic mail merge where you're just, you know, like you said, the Mad Libs, you're just filling in the blanks. Uh, there's a very limited logic, there's a very limited list capability versus something that's more complex where you actually have, you know, sections of the document that are in, and, in or out based on questions. Uh, you have advanced logic and then you also have advanced lists. So you don't always know how many parties to the document you're going to have uh, or the transaction beforehand. Uh, you can You can go ahead and set that up and then in a complex document automation system, all the punctuations will be correct, all the pronouns will be correct, everything else. And that's usually much more difficult to get correct in a merge uh, automation situation. So I like drawing the line between merge automation and, and complex automation. Uh, there's also a difference with what type of documents are, you want to talk about. And I think this is also a, a really good chart and a, and a good uh, sort of segue into, into document automation. And that is what type of documents are, are used, can be automated or should be automated. And so what you've got is you've got sort of this, we've got this graph with these four quadrants and on one axis of the graph is frequency of production. How often am I producing that type of document? And then also, you know, the question is, is, is it difficult or time consuming? If it's, if you're in quadrant three and it's easy and you don't do it very often, you probably don't need to automate that because if it's, if it's simple, it only takes you a couple of minutes to draft it and you only have to do it like once a year, not worth automating. But the, the big jumps really are on the, in the top part of the graph here where you're doing the same kind of document over and over and over again. And what you've got is you've got quadrant one, which is sort of easy documents that you do every day. And that might be something, for example, like a fax cover sheet. Uh, and if you've got document automation or even merge automation, you've got that hooked up to a case management system and you can automate that. Uh, you know, even if you can save you know, 10 seconds every time you do a fax cover sheet or even 30 seconds or a minute, uh, that adds up after a while if you're doing it a lot, if you're doing that all the time. 
the big quadrant that's really good for automation is quadrant two, which is documents that you're automating, you're producing all the time, and they're difficult and time consuming. So this would be more transactional kind of stuff, where uh, where it's not just it's not just that they're difficult or time consuming. It's it's also I think a, a classification of that should be that they're they're fairly they're fairly um, defined documents. You've got the same type of language that you're using over and over and over again. Uh, and instead of taking the old document, copying it, saving it as a new one, and editing it, you can make those provisions and sort of engineer your document to to be automated, so that you go through, answer a series of questions about what you actually need in that document, and get a really good draft out in you know a tenth of the time. And that's really what we're talking about. Quadrant four is an interesting quadrant because those are difficult and time-consuming, but you're not doing them very often. And so if that's the case, then uh, you know maybe that's not a, a good good thing to automate. But if it's really time consuming uh, and it would be worth it to automate, then, then I guess you could. But really, the top part of that graph is really the, the main the main uh, area that documents are really, really strong for document automation. Yeah, yeah I would Ed. think if, if you wanted to do it yourself, starting in one is probably the best place to go. And if you want to pay someone to automate your templates, your documents for you, uh, you'd be better off paying uh, in Quadrant 2. Yeah, probably. Probably. Okay. I, and also, I've got a couple different workflows just to kind of illustrate there's sort of different scenarios that you can use document automation in. One is um, you've got an interview, you answer the questions, the system does this little assembly thing, and you get out a document. That's one sort of basic workflow, and I think that's the one people most commonly use. Another one is you can... Uh, answer the questions, generate a document, and then you can save the answers to your questions in an answer file and then use that again to generate another document. So you can sort of build up a set of answers as you go along and you can do a whole series of documents uh, throughout your assembly process. Then you can take it a step further and you can say, well, I just want to ask the questions once and have it give me out a set of documents. So, for example, uh, we did a small business loan package at one point which cranked out, you know, 13 or 20 documents. Uh, for a small business loan, they'd answer one series of questions, and then you'd get 13 documents out at the end of the assembly process, which is really good. And then when you add case management into that, you can actually have the case management program seed the answer file, and then you can either ask additional questions or not ask any questions and get a document out. And so I think that's also a very good use of technology, and that's a fantastic way to automate because you want to put that information into your case management system anyways. So once it's in there, you can actually use the information to get work done with document automation. So not only am I putting the client's name and address and all the other sort of information and case scheduling and everything else into my case management system, I can then use that information to actually produce documents and get work done, which I think is really fantastic. Okay, and then in terms of the process for document automation, Really what you want to do is you want to start off with sort of what we like to call a gold standard template or, uh, you know, just a, just a marked up version of, of what you're trying to do. So in this case, this is an example of a promissory note that we've marked up uh, in preparation for automation. And so you can see that we've got all of the, the text that changes highlighted. So the note amount changes, the execution date uh, changes, the execution city. We've got payor names. Uh, if there could be more than one, so we, we might want to have, you know, party one and party two or party one comma party two and party three. Uh, and these document automation systems can all handle that. Uh, we've got the interest rate. We can compute different things. And we've got some questions. Is there a prepayment penalty? If yes, we're going to insert this text. Otherwise, we're going to insert this text. And then is the note secure with real estate? We've got more conditional text here. We want to be able to... Uh, bring that text in or out based on answers to questions. Once you go from the markup stage, you then proceed to the coding stage. And so this is the exact same document. In this case, we've coded it in hot docs. Uh, and you can see it's the exact same information was before, only now it has uh, the fields in there, the hot docs fields for the note amount. We've got a uh, payor repeat with punctuation. So regardless of how many payors we enter in, uh, the system will get the punctuation right. We've got, uh, if there's more than one payor, we insert the word collectively. And then we've got the rest of the encoding up, including our logic around our conditional text in the document. And then finally, when we run that, instead of having to 
do a find and replace or type the text and worry about everything. All we have to do is just fill in the relevant information into an interview, and then the system generates the document based off of that information. And this information can either come from an, the interview in the document automation system like this, or this all could be in a case management system. You just pull it all out, hit a button, and it uh, generates the document. And uh, I think one of the things you'll find if you get on this path is that uh, creating the single gold standard template is probably one of the more valuable things you will do in that most uh, firms and most law departments have language that individual attorneys prefer or are, as John mentioned, situational specific if there's an adjustable rate uh, loan, for example. And being able to have that all that information in a single point in and of itself is valuable. So once you get into that document, then moving on to the automation is um, much easier. I agree. All right, ready for the next question? Absolutely. So um, you can't, the question, uh, of course, about office apps, and if we're not using an office app, what would you recommend to automate? Um, you can do automation, uh, simple as John mentioned, merge automation, or as I called it, Mad Libs, uh, in Microsoft Word. And um, I'll defer to John on this as to whether you can do it in uh, WordPerfect or some other word processors. Um, but uh, it is merge automation only, so you're going to be dropping in or answering uh, questions as you go along. There's not going to be a special interview like uh, we showed earlier with the payee, payor aspect. Uh, John mentioned on the list of payees and payors that there was a comma separating punctuation, and you didn't have to know in advance how many payees or payors there would be. Uh, that functionality is not available in Word's uh, merge automation. And um, we did mention also with, for example, the adjustable rate loan, you can do some simple if logic in Microsoft Word. It is more challenging than it would be to do in um, just about any of the document automation programs that would be separate programs yet integrate with Word. And uh, on that same sort of if logic idea, Word using the what they call the legacy form fields, which are still available either in uh, Word for Windows as legacy fields are actually the only fields uh, that are available in Word for Mac. Uh, you can do simple things so related to, say, gender. So if on the start of a pleading or a document, you indicate that the um, plaintiff, for example, is a man, then you can set up the legacy controls so that further down you don't have to select he or his or things like that. So that's possible in Word. A little time-consuming, but not horrible. And then if you really want to go all out on a Word uh, document merge automation, you can do a Visual Basic for applications, which involves a fairly decent knowledge of programming and is quite time consuming relative to purchasing a document automation tool separately. Yeah, and, and with the VBA, um... Uh, you know, the big the big drawback with that is that it, you really have to do everything manually. You have to lay out all the controls and the dialogue. You have to determine what fields they are. You have to build a lot of procedures to populate the document after you hit the OK button. Um, it's a very, very time consuming thing. Uh, so if I had the same document and I was going to I was going to code the document in Hot Docs or Express Docs or the form tool or Contract Express, I could literally do it in a tenth of the time it would take me to code it in VBA. Um, VBA really is that time consuming. And, and part of the reason is that um, the VBA environment, you really, it's a very, very manual process. You would have to go in and you would actually have to insert a user form. You would get this user form in here. You would have to literally draw every single field and label it uh, the way that you wanted it to be labeled. And then you'd have to right click it and you'd have to view code and you'd actually have to type the code in uh, to make it work. And that's even before you get to the document where you'd have to find a way to either insert it into a content control or into a field or into a bookmark. So it's a it's a pretty time consuming process to use the VBA in Word. That said, it, it's still, you know, a valid thing to do. And we have people that do that. So it's not a, it's not a bad way to do it. It's just, uh, way more time consuming than buying an off the shelf 
document automation tool and, and doing it that way. Um, when we talked about the content controls versus the legacy fields, this is on the developer tab in Word. And so if you go into the developer tab in Word, you may not have that showing when you go into Microsoft Word. And to show the developer tab, you actually have to go to File and then Options and then Customize Ribbon. And there's a check mark here for the developer tab. And if it's not checked, you won't see it. But if you check the developer tab, it will show up. And on the developer tab, you have two different sets of controls here. And I've sort of outlined it on the slide. You've got the content controls and then the legacy fields. The content controls um, give you sort of these new modern looking controls. And they're pretty nice. And we've had some people do some pretty amazing things with those. Uh, so like this is an example of a, of a combo box where you'd have a drop down menu and you could choose an item, which is pretty nice. The legacy fields, um, they're a little bit more primitive looking. So if I insert a legacy field here, you can see it just shows up as a shaded box. But you can actually do a few different things with the legacy fields that you can't do with the content controls. So for example, uh, conditional text is really difficult with a content control. So if you want to be able to say, you know, enter in his, her, or male, female, and get the pronouns in the rest of the document, really difficult to do with the content controls versus the legacy fields, uh, you can actually do that pretty easily. But I've got the example here. The content controls are the newer, uh, sort of nice looking controls and the legacy forms of the old just field codes there. And then also, um, WordPerfect is still has a pretty good macro system. So you can actually do some pretty neat things with WordPerfect as well. So I don't want to, I don't want to restrict ourselves to just Word here, although most people probably have Word. Yeah. If, if you're just getting into doing, uh, merge automation, which would be the dropping in of the names and stuff like that, the, um, Using legacy fields works out pretty well. We've got a couple of firms that I've worked with that set them up uh, as uh, protected Word templates so that every time the staff or the attorney clicks on it, they get a brand new document. It's locked down. They can tab through all the fields and type in the names and whatever. Uh, you might have seen it's kind of like filling out a PDF uh, form from the user's perspective. And then when they tab out of the last field of the document, it unlocks and they can edit everything and the fields go away and it's just a straight word document. So if you're looking for a really inexpensive way, it involves a little bit more tinkering, uh, doing the legacy fields might be a way to go. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's a that's a good answer um, as well. I think the legacy fields sometimes are easier. Although the new content controls, they look nice. All right, so why has it, why has document automation failed to gain traction is it too expensive? Is it too hard to get through configuration with uh, client clauses? Uh, there are a couple of a uh, couple of good answers to this. Uh, number one is that um, for a lot of firms uh, that can benefit from automation, which is most firms, there's not someone dedicated to the task of creating and maintaining the forms. It's usually given to a paralegal or a secretary or the most tech-savvy young attorney or something like that. And at the same time that they're supposed to do this, they're also supposed to maintain a full caseload, deal with clients, all that sort of stuff. So if, um, if you don't have the time to perform this task and you don't have anyone whose sole job it is, then it kind of gets, you know, pushed down the, uh, the lane and in this, in the idea that, you know, um, it comes after the billable work. You know, the billable work pays the bills, and there's not thought the time to be put together to say, well, we, you know, we're going to spend this much time up front, but we're going to benefit greatly by being able to more quickly serve our clients or not have to hire another paralegal or whatever because we've been able to do some automation. In some of the larger firms, there are actually people uh, dedicated to maintaining document libraries and automation. So they, they've done that in-house probably in large part because they have the budget and the resources to do that, but with smaller and mid-sized firms, we're not seeing that. Second thing out there uh, is kind of a lack of planning. Um, we mentioned earlier uh, with one of John's slides that getting all of your language in one place is sort of the first step to creating the ideal um, template as a starting point for your automation, whether it's merge automation or full-on complex document automation. 
And so if if no one's in charge and no one's putting together that single source of documents, you either start, you know, sporadically automating maybe one will and one trust, then you go off and maybe do one version of a power of attorney and there's no consistency, there's no organization. And so um, it kind of all falls apart. And the other problem might be, and we've seen this in several firms, that there is uh, such a preference uh, for language that is so different between different attorneys uh, working the same types of matters that it's essentially, if not impossible, very difficult to uh, to agree on a document that would be your starting point for automation. I can think of a firm in, uh, I think it was in Michigan, where we ended up writing a, you know, you might always include a, a selection for the attorney, you know, for the signature block or whatever in the document. And we actually ended up using that variable to distinguish between different clauses because one attorney preferred doing a family listing of, you know, uh, spouses and kids one way. Another attorney wanted to do it another way. Another attorney wanted it in a completely separate part of the document. So we ended up using that one selection to drive a lot of the different changes in the documents just based on the fact that three attorneys in a single firm couldn't agree on how the document should be structured or read. You know, I think, I think, I think another issue on lack of planning as well is not realizing how people are using the documents. Because I've, I've, I've been on projects before where we've created what we think is a pretty good set of documents and then it turned out like something was was fundamentally flawed with the way uh that they that the the people who actually were, were generating the documents needed uh then to come out in in the it was a it was a you know in the right order in the right way and because this one you know workflow didn't didn't fit in um it didn't work and i think that kind of goes to lack of lack of planning too is that you need to have some sort of understanding about what your workflow is and and you know what order things need to happen in absolutely we've had uh you know we always try to work with the people uh when we do a project for a firm or our department with the folks who are um not just the experts in the law but also experts in the actual mechanics of the document so if you've got a paralegal who knows exactly how things should be done it might be or it would be very valuable to talk to that person in addition to the lawyer who knows why the clauses should say what they say. So if you if you end up creating a document that doesn't match what the court needs but has the right wording, it's it would be better than essential actually to have both of those that it has the proper wording, and it's what the uh, paralegal is able to take to the court or to wherever to to uh, affect what the document should do. Another uh, issue that we sort of listed here is cost, and we've talked a little bit about um, the large initial investment, not just of time for uh, for someone, but also there is a cost investment, assuming you're going to go the route of an actual document automation program as opposed to just doing the word legacy fields. So each of the document automation programs are charged on a per per user basis. So there's going to be some cost to that. Some of them are monthly. Some of them are one-time purchases, depending on which product you go with. And then um, in addition to actually purchasing the software, a lot of these programs, some are better than others, um, have training of different levels of quality. So you don't, or if you end up buying maybe a program that's like uh, going to Home Depot and you get a, a set of two by fours and a hammer and nail and then the theory is okay now go build a house so you've you've got to think about not just the cost of the software but also how are you going to get someone either in-house or if you're going to hire uh, an outside firm like us to do the development what is that going to cost uh, in terms of money and time you know and, and i think you know in terms of cost though you can always start small um you know, one of the firms we autom did an automation project for was um, a firm in California, and the only thing we automated for them was a certificate of service. And the certificate of service would come out of uh, Time Matters, so they could be in Time Matters, hit a button. Uh, Time Matters would send the information to Hot Docs, and Hot Docs would generate a certificate of service for whatever case it was. And um, we did that for them, and we didn't hear for them for a number of years until. Uh, their Time Matters upgraded and the link broke, and it turned out that they were using that template 
every single day, you know, 10 times a day. And their firm was just brought to a halt by when it, when it didn't work because people didn't want to have to do that by hand anymore. And it just saved them a tremendous amount of time. So even though that, you know, template was, was probably, you know, fairly expensive to implement initially, uh, the payoff was huge further on down the road. It really streamlined their whole operation just from having that that one template. It was a very litigation intensive firm. So um, that's something to think about with, with costs. Absolutely. And uh, finally on our list here, we've got fear. And if you're reading any sort of business magazine these days, you you know, people are worried about automation or artificial intelligence and like so many jobs that could be replaced by computers making decisions and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of um a lot of uh feeling and not not incorrectly that something you do is special and can't be, you know, a little bit computerized or a little bit assisted because it's so unique and it you know, it can't be put down to a bunch of statements that go if this then that or otherwise. Uh and you know, some but some of the stuff that you hate the most, like maybe filling out certificates of service, can actually be automated. So it's not like we're saying the computer is going to write your um, your trust for you, or it's going to write your uh, you know some motion for summary judgment or something. If there's a bunch of stuff, remember that quadrant one, the stuff you do all the time that's very quick. You know, if you can make it just a little bit quicker, it's not like taking over the intellectual aspect of your job or your responsibilities. It's just getting that little sort of crufty stuff out of the way so you can do more interesting stuff. All right. Ready for the next question? Absolutely. So um, can uh, any document automation application work as a plug-in or an add-in to custom in-house case management software? And the answer is generally yes. It depends sort of on what database back end you're running on your custom in-house software. Assuming it's uh, like a standard SQL or, or something like that, then just about all of the, uh, well, at least uh, three of the four on the screen there could integrate without any trouble. Contract Express, if your database is local, I'm not sure, would it integrate with that, John? Uh, you can you can get a local instance of Contract Express. You can, okay. And I think technically if you wanted to, you might be able to open your firewall, but I'm not sure you want to do that. Yeah. Um, there's there's some security issues there that you need to be aware of, but um, so yeah, if you're if you're running any if you're running this stuff locally, either on like your own server that you control, then uh, certainly Hot Docs, Express Docs, and Docs or RDB can reach in and talk to that data. Contract Express lives in the in the uh, on the internet, so it's it's a website. And as Sean mentioned, if you wanted to, you might be able to link your local case management program through your firewall to the internet but that or you get you get a local install of contract express as well they do allow that so okay um you could have it locally installed and run it out of your own on you know out of your own on your own server so if you did that you could also hook it up that way so those, yeah any of the those are kind of the big four that you see on the screen there any of them will talk to uh, a standard database and um, the one issue that you kind of want to think about that we mentioned here on the slide is field alignment. And what that means is that if you want something in the document, it also has to exist in your case management system. Seems like a no-brainer, but you would be surprised at some of the uh, responses we get when we talk to folks and they said X, Y, and D didn't come in, but then they're not actually storing that in their case management system. So if the data is in your case management system and it's a standard sort of database, we can pull that into uh, the major uh, platforms out there for automation. And the second thing with field alignment is to make sure that when you're creating um, variables or sort of um, fields in the, the document automation system, it needs to match the format that is in your case management system. And so basically for layman, if you're storing dates or uh, text names, dollar amounts, whatever, so dates, text numbers, that the that type of field that is in your case management system matches the sort of variable or placeholder that you create in the 
document automation system as well. Yeah, and I, and I think that really goes to the idea of concept of garbage in, garbage out. So you know, if your if your data in your database is garbage, your your data that when it comes through into the document automation system is going to be garbage. So for example, if you've got a text field in the database and you're using that to store a date value. Um, and people are just using that randomly how and typing in however they want. So if someone types in a full date, you know, like like 9 2019 and someone else types in September 2019, and someone else just types in September, and somebody else just types in 2019 in that field, there's no consistency, and, and it's going to be really hard to get anything meaningful out of that into a document versus if, if the date data in the database was actually forced to be in a date format. Everyone had to enter it and actually put a date in there. Um, that's going to come through uh, automatically. And so that, that's that's just something we've seen where people either use a field um, at unintended uh, as it's not intended or, you know, it's it's they put too much information in the field. So like a lot of things that we've seen that cause a lot of problems are actually in contact fields when you have a married couple as a client. Um, people will go in and in the first name of the in the first name field for the client, they'll put John and Mary. Instead of having a separate contact for John and a separate contact for Mary, they'll have John and Mary Smith. Well, when you bring that into the document automation system, it it still thinks that's just a first name field. It doesn't know that there's actually two names in there, uh, and that's something that's pretty difficult to to code and determine uh, whether or not there's one name or two names there. And so that's another example of field alignment. And you really need to make sure that if you if you take this path, that you know your your field you have good data, and your and your fields all align. And I think one other thing to be aware of is that um, you know Hot Docs and Express Docs both have desktop versions and server versions of their software. Express Docs you can run the server locally or through a hosted application. Hot Docs you can actually run locally or on a hosted application. But if you're hooking into a database that's in your office, you probably want a local installation, so you don't have to communicate with that serve with that document automation server over the internet. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that a lot of web-based case management systems don't have uh, integrations with a lot of document automation systems yet. Uh, the one exception to that is ActionStep. ActionStep actually has a HotDocs instance built into it, so you can actually use HotDocs within ActionStep. Uh, another one is Salesforce. Uh, both Express Docs and Contract Express have Salesforce uh, integrations uh, available directly. So that's just something else to consider. All right, ready for the next question, Jeff? Yep. All right. All right. So, how do you automate uh, gender in a document with either Amicus Attorney or Word 2019? All right. Um, so um, I'll take this one, Jeff. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So what we're talking about here is in Amicus Attorney, I've got a contact card, and the contacts in Amicus Attorney don't have a gender field by default. And so uh, what you probably want to do is add a gender field uh, as a custom uh, field on a custom page within Amicus Attorney. So that's what I've done in this example. I've taken the contact card, I created a custom page, and I both created a gender field and a date of birth, and the gender field is going to be male or female. You could also make it three, you could do male, female entity, or you could do whatever you want there. But I've created this extra field, and so the question is, how do I use this field to, to get the right pronouns into the document, uh, and how do I get it into the document? So when you put a custom field on Amicus Attorney, what happens is is that it creates a uh, custom person variable, and so this variable is actually called PCST uh, for people custom, and then I just I named it gender, so that's what it is. And so when you uh, go into and you create a new merge document in Amicus Attorney, there's a field selector on uh, one of the ribbons. And when you go to the ribbon, you can click the field selector, and I say I want people custom information, and I've got my two custom fields there, both date of birth and gender. And when I insert them into the Word document, uh, they're going to come in as one of two ways, and it just depends on whether I'm showing my field codes or not. And again, uh, the fields that it's using, it's really just using the mail merge fields, which are very similar to the legacy fields uh, we talked about earlier when you're automating uh, Word. And so with the legacy fields, you'll see one of two things. You either see what the field code is or you see the field result. So in this case, the field result 
when you pop this variable in, it's just TCST underscore gender. But the actual field code behind the scenes has these curly braces, and then it's called merge field TCST gender. So again, it's just using it's using the regular Microsoft Word mail merge mail merge fields. And then to compute the pronouns based off of that, you have to do an if statement. And so you can do if statements in uh, in Word uh, in the mail merge. Uh, they're somewhat limited though. They're sort of inline if statements. So what I have is I have if the gender variable uh, is equal to male, then we're going to insert his, otherwise we're going to insert her. And so the way the if statement works is it says if condition, if the condition is true, insert this text, if the condition is false, do this. So the other way I could write this is I could write it back the other way and just say if merge field uh, equals female, then put her in, otherwise put his in. They both do, all these do the exact same thing. And you'll notice that in this top one, I'm showing the field result for the gender merge field, but in the bottom, I'm showing all the codes. And so this is actually a nested field because the merge field's nested within this if statement. And so that's basically how you would do it. And then uh, this is just a further example of, of how I got the different pronouns. And these are just different ways of doing uh, the same thing. So uh, I can do a, a his, her, uh, and I actually wanted to show the merge code there. I, I messed that up, but I've got uh, if gender's female, do her, then his. If the merge field gender is male, do he, she. Um, or I could do the other way and say if the merge field is female, then do she, he. Both of these are the do the exact same thing. They're just coded differently. Oops, go back did, one. Did you want to explain the why her is first and his is second, or his is first and her is second? Yeah, because it's it's the it's the the first uh, bit of text here is if this condition is true. So if the gender is male, I want he. Versus in the bottom one, if the gender is female, I'm going to put she. And again, both of these statements do the exact same thing. I wouldn't put them both in the same document. I would just code it one way. I just wanted to show both ways just in case. So in this case, the gender is female coming out of amicus. And if it's female, I'm going to, if it's, if it's male, it's his. Otherwise, it's her. So I get her. Um, that's the same one. And then the same thing here. If it's female, I get her, the first one versus getting the second one. So if it was male, it would go the other way. But that's how you would do that um, there. The other trick to this is that um, when you're generating a document out of Amicus, there's two different places you can generate it from. You can generate it from the contact card or you can generate it from the, from the file. And so in this case, if uh, I generate it from the contact card, this works fine. But if I generate it from the file, you want to make sure that you say based on the selected template using information about this particular contact. So you would actually pick the contact in the in the in the matter in the file, and then run the document generation and say you want it for this contact. And the reason is is that uh, the people custom variable, the people custom fields that we created for the gender don't work on the people of the file uh, uh, one. So for example. There's sort of two ways when you create a matter, when you run document automation off of, out of Amicus, that this can work. One is you can pick a contact and say, run the document automation for this contact in the file. The other one is you can say, create one document for all the contacts on the file. And if you create it for all the contacts on the file, it doesn't pull through the gender, the, the custom fields on the people tab. And I know this is way more information than people want, but I just wanted to give a thorough answer to the question. Um, but it won't come through. So you have to make sure that you pick the uh, person and you do this one on the file, which is based on the selected contact, or you just run it off the people tab to get that variable to come through. And again, you can see uh, in the Amicus help, there is people custom information, and this is, describes how that field works. This field does not exist uh, with the people on the file. So there are people on the file merge variables, you can say, give me the name of the first person, the second person, the third person, and use that in your mail merge. But those custom people fields, like the gender, won't come through if you do that. Uh, so that's just one of those gotchas to watch out for. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this this was a very specific uh, question. Uh, software for Chilean companies. Um, and uh, the answer is yes, that all the programs that we We've mentioned on the previous slide, um, 
Express Docs, Hot Docs, uh, the Form Tool, or Docsera, and um, Contract Express all support multiple languages. We have run into uh, some couple of unique issues when doing uh, some, you know, for us, uh, foreign language documents, non-English documents uh, in the tools uh, or in Hot Docs specifically related to how um, a key uh, font character is used. But generally speaking, uh, they should work for all languages. We know uh, there's a couple, at least one uh, firm we've worked with in Spain, obviously Spanish, uh, using Doxera uh, with uh, databases. So uh, it should be all languages for the uh, programs out there. Yeah, and they, they specifically support multiple languages. So, I, I mean, I know that, uh, I mean, Hot Docs even supports Japanese. So, uh, uh, you know, and Express Docs, I know, has built-in functions for uh, currency and foreign language, or, you know, foreign currencies, and I believe Hot Docs and Contract Express all do as well. And then Docs to Rock pretty much handle any formatting that, that's obviously in Word. So I, I don't think that should be an issue. Uh, in any of those programs. So the answer is, is yes, those all work with, with foreign languages. Now, and this this is one of my favorite questions because I think, I, I you know, sometime in the future, I'd like to be able to travel with just my uh, cellular connected iPad and do just about all my work from that. So, wow, what uh, document automation tools can you use uh, on the web? And the answer is um, that uh, all the programs that we've mentioned have uh, web uh, analogs or web versions. We talked a little bit ago about um, either doing an on-premises version or a hosted version of uh, Hot Docs, Express Docs, Contract Express, and those three all have uh, the ability to actually run the program in the cloud. So if you're like me and you use a Mac or you're like me and you want to travel only with your cellular iPad and not a full computer, then you can program the documents. You can do the coding that we've talked about earlier in, uh, generally speaking, in, uh, well, actually exclusively in Windows, and then upload the documents to one of these websites and run them on any platform that has internet access, including your iPhone, if you're a fan of tiny screens when you're filling out those questionnaires. And Jeff, I don't have screenshots of all of these, but I got a screenshot of, this is how Hot Docs Advanced looks. Uh, in the web, and Hot Docs Advanced is the next newer version of Hot Docs. So there's sort of a Hot Docs Classic, and now there's Hot Docs Advanced, and this is a screenshot of what uh, Hot Docs looks like in the cloud under the new Hot Docs Advanced, and then here's an example screenshot of what Express Docs looks like in the cloud. And so uh, you can see it gives you all the fields there, and uh, Hot Docs, Express Docs, and Contract Express all actually assemble the documents in the cloud. So you've got the interview in the web browser, uh, you can assemble the document in the web browser and then download the document using your web browser. Uh, uh, the form tool has a web interface for an interview, but you still have to assemble the documents on the web, on the desktop. And what it does is it goes out to the web, gets that data and then brings it down and it assembles the document for you automatically. Yeah, so if you're doing, if you want to do something like a client interview or you want to have something on your website, people can answer and you get the information back. All four of them will uh, will do that. The difference being that for uh, the form tool uh, product, which is known as Aurora, you then have to go into uh, Microsoft Word for Windows and assemble, like pull, like John mentioned, pull down that information and then generate the document on your local computer. So uh, no generation on the web, no using your iPad or whatever to create the document. Um, and uh, web case management programs, we talked a little, way back at the beginning about the difference between merge automation and more complex uh, um, document assembly. Most or perhaps all of the case management programs that are web-based. I know Clio, uh, ActionStep as well, I assume Rocket Matter, uh, and the rest all have sort of the Mad Libs uh, merge automation functionality where you can take uh, data that you're collecting in the case management system and literally drop it in word for word into a uh, document. Yeah, and that's true, Jeff. I'm in, and I think that's true with Clio, Rocket Matter, and, and a lot of the other ones. Um, it's basically just a mail, a mail merge with Word. 
uh, is really what it is. They 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 seed uh, a, a file with the answers, and then you run, and any any function you can use in Word Mail Merge works in those, uh, including those inline if statements I showed you before with uh, Mika's attorney. That's just a mail merge if, and those work in uh, Clio and uh, Rocket Matter and some of the other ones as well that just use a basic merge automation. And again. You know, the dividing line between complex and simple automation, simple automation is still good. I mean, and it still might do the trick for what you need it to do. But for more complex documents, so let's say you're doing a, you know, a signature line and you don't know how many parties there are, that can be really, really difficult to do with a merge automation versus, you know, in Hot Docs, Express Docs, the form tool or Contract Express, it's, it's just a trivial problem. And, you know, I'd, I'd mention this as well because a lot of people think that, uh, you know, Hot Docs is hard, or Express Docs is hard, or you know, name fill in the name of the blank of the you know name of the document automation tool is hard. And if you just want to do simple automation, those tools make simple automation even easier. Um, you can just drop in fields if the basic conditional logic is is far easier to use, I think, than words. Um, but the advantage of those systems is that you can then take the jump to more complex automation. You know, you can do conditional tables, you can do, you know, uh, conditional sections of the document, you can insert, uh, you know, different parts of documents into other documents. There's a lot of things you can do with the complex automation. Plus, with all the systems, systems, you get to ask additional questions. And with a lot of the, you know, web case management merge automation, there's no additional questions that you can ask most of the time. Um, a couple of them have that provision, but most of them don't. So if there's ever any additional information, you've got to find some other way to get that in there versus, you know, Hot Docs, Express Docs, Contract Express, Docs, or uh, all of those provide you with the ability to, to answer additional questions and, and have the document change based on those answers. Okay. Awesome. And uh, finally, uh, it wouldn't be a webinar if we didn't do a little bit of self-promotion. So for those of you who want to learn more about uh, document automation and hear our uh, glorious uh, sonorous voices some more, uh, feel free to uh, listen to the podcast, uh, Docs After Dark. And if you have any uh, comments on the podcast, we'd love to hear them. Uh, most of the content is user-generated, so send us comments to comments at docsafterdark.com. We're on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Play, just about any place you can normally find a podcast. We're there. All right. And with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Karen. Great. And I love your podcast. So I hope everyone will uh, tune in and check that out as well. Um, so thank you, John. And thank you, Jeff. Great job answering everyone's questions today. Uh, and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, I do not show any other uh, questions at this point. If you do have any, feel free to um, go ahead and throw those in there. Um, otherwise, uh, you're welcome to um, contact us. If we missed an important question or if our answers created more questions, um, go ahead and reach out to us. You can respond to my follow-up email or you can send a note directly to John or Jeff. Um, or you can take advantage of our free 30-minute consultation and speak with one of the document automation experts at Affinity. Again, just reply to the follow-up email I'm about to send, or, and I'll do the rest. Uh, we do have more Q&A webinars coming up. Default services in the mortgage banking realm are up next in September, and our final session will be about practice management in October. Uh, check those out and all the other webinars we offer by jumping onto affinityconsulting.com slash webinars. Watch for my follow-up email coming to you shortly with today's PowerPoint and recording. And please do share your feedback with us on the survey that follows. Thanks, everyone.